Diego Correa from the University of La Plata. Please. Okay, well, thank you very much for, for the invitation and the opportunity to, to give this talk. Um, well, today I'm going to be talking about some recent results done in collaboration with two colleagues from Argentina, Matias Leoni and Solange Luque. And it has to do with the discovery <coughs> of integrability uh, from Wilson loops, but non-supersymmetric Wilson loops. Um, uh, more precisely, the ordinary Wilson loop with no couplings to the scalar fields in unequal four super young mills. So, in just a single slide, the scheme of, of the talk I'm going to be presenting today can go as follows. I will be uh, inserting two composite operators uh, in a Wilson line, and I will compute a correlator between these two insertions with the novelty that instead of using the usual locally supersymmetric Wilson loop, we are going to insert these operators in a Wilson loop with this additional parameter zeta uh, that allows you to interpolate between the locally supersymmetric Wilson loop when you set zeta equal to 1 and the ordinary Wilson loop with no coupling to the scalar fields when you set zeta equal to 0. So while we will compute at one loop the mixing of these different uh, composite operators you can insert along this line and then you will get this will get this mixing operator which is interpreted as a spin chain as a spin chain Hamiltonian in this case an open spin chain and we will okay formulate a better answer obtain what is the corresponding reflection matrix for excitations on the backing of this spin chain and then verify the boundary and Baxter equation and we will find that not only the supersymmetric Wilson loop is integrable, that was something that we already knew, but also the, the ordinary Wilson loop sets integral boundary conditions for this. Uh, by? Oh, sorry. It's, it's typically, you will see that you... you I, I will define later on. So. Now, that was just a sketch of what is going to be the talk. So let me motivate uh, this computation. Well, why to compute? Why do you be interested in Wilson loops in n equal 4 super young mills? Well, to begin with, n equal 4 super young mills is maybe not the most interesting non abelian for dimensional gauge theory, but it is certainly the simplest interacting uh, non abelian for dimensional gauge theory. And moreover, it is the, the gauge theory in the prototypical example of ATS-CFT. So if you would like to learn about ATS-CFT, it is the, the best lab. Then Wilson loops, not only in N equal 4, but in any gauge theory, are, are very important observable because they can be provided with a neat uh, physical interpretation. Um, for instance, by computing expectation value of Wilson loops, you can extract the quark anti quark potential of the gauge theory, or, or even the, the Vestralum function. The Vestralum function is a coefficient that calibrates the energy radiated by accelerated charges in, in the gauge theory. So, and then in, in, the, in this context of, of n equal 4, there were some locally supersymmetric Wilson loops that was, those that, that was mainly being studied in the literature, and those are very interesting because they could be. Uh, treated with a variety of sophisticated theoretical tools such as integrability, conformal bootstrap, or supersymmetric localization, which allows you to compute to get exact results somehow. <coughs> but today, or with, with this recent work, our motivation was to explore the possibility of applying some of these tools to ordinary Wilson loops, those that non-locally supersymmetric. So, and more precisely, of course, we won't be able to use supersymmetric localization, but you could study the ordinary Wilson loops using integrability, maybe, and conformal bootstrap. So, well, the outline is I will just start with a, a brief review or introduction of Wilson loops and the, well, some uh, characteristic examples of, of Wilson loops. And then we will just sketch how it is that you can use 
integrability to compute uh, expectation values of uh, certain Wilson loops in n equal four super young nils. Then I, I will jump into the precise problem I, I was uh, in, uh, saying to you that we, we studied is this to, to introduce insertions in these generalized Wilson loops, which are non-locally supersymmetric. And then I will present some checks of integrability when you consider uh, insertions in, in, in certain subsectors of the theory. By, by sectors, I mean these insertions operators in principle can be made out of all the fields you have in n equal four to be mil, but if you restrict to certain sectors, you, you get simpler computations and then as, as long as the, this, uh, these sectors are closed, this is a consistent restriction. So I will be considering these two sectors, SO6 and SU2 slash 3, I will describe them later on. So, <coughs> okay. Uh, well, a Wilson loop is a non-local observable that measures some non-abelian phase that acquires some non-dynamical, very massive external particle that you force to move along a close contour uh, in the presence of the gauge fields of a uh, the fields of a gauge theory, and it's defined through the the holonomy of the gauge field by this in this way. And then once you you set your, your gauge theory, the Wilson loop can depend on only two things. It depends on the the, the, the trajectory you take where you move this, this external particle. This is encoded in the uh, in the parametrization of, of, of your contour integral. And also, it depends on the, the type or the charge of the particle that you, you move along this contour. And this other thing is this, this, this characteristic is encoded in the trace in which you take in the representation of the gauge group in which you take this trace. So anyway, I, for the rest of the talk, I, I'm going to be focusing on the fundamental representation, so that's why I'm going to be talking about quarks. But you, you, you could uh, define it for, for more general representations as well. Okay, but as I said, one of the th nice things about Wilson loops is that they have not only f a valuable but also neat physical interpretation about the gauge theory, depending on how do you, you define your, your contours. So let me just go through the most uh, typical examples of Wilson loops. One of them is, is the very elongated rectangle, right? If you take the Wilson loop in this elongated rectangle, yeah, you, 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 you can see that the expectation value goes as the exponential of some coefficient that depends on this uh, separation r, Pro and it's, it's times the, this, 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 length, this, this long length of the rectangle t. Uh, well, you can see that this is the the, 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 the static energy of the quark anti quark potential, and this is a very important quantity in negative theory because it can reveal whether you are in a confining phase or a, or, is or, or 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 not, right? Um, for instance, uh, the, you 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 are in a confining phase whenever the static potential grows linearly with the distance, right? <coughs> if this uh, is proportional to R then this uh, expectation value of this Wilson loop would go as the exponential of some numeric coefficient times r times t. r times t is the area of the rectangle. And this is the famous area law, that if, if you compute that the expectation value of your Wilson loop goes like the exponential of the area, your theory is, is confining. <coughs> well, another thing that you, you can describe with, with Wilson loops is this Prestrelum function, you, you can obtain the Prestrelum function when you compute the expectation value of a Wilson loop in a wavy line. A wavy line is just a trajectory which is slightly deviating from the from the straight line. And then, you, you, you uh, out of this, you, you, you th what it gives you is the, the coefficient that goes in front of the the analog of the Larmor's formula that that measures the the energy radiated by a charge that is accelerated. So those, well, I, I wanted just to mention these two um, physical quantities that you, you can compute out of expectation values of Wilson loops. And precisely, I mentioned these two because the two of them can be related to, to this guy, the, the Casper number that I mentioned. 
So this is also a very important quantity you can compute, you can define in, in that, that specifies your, 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 your characterizes your gauge theory, and it is the cast polymer dimension. So typically it's <coughs> whenever you have like a sudden change in the direction of your Wilson loop, this introduces logarithmic divergences. So those, uh, those, those is because of that the, the appearances of this UV and, and also infrared cutoff because I know I'm considering like a, an infinite line. And the cast panomer dimension is just the coefficient in front of this uh, logarithmic divergences, right? Well, but then uh, you can see that you can relate this 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 this, this quantity with the the the, the quantities I, I defined in the previous slide, the quark and the quark potential, and also the restoring function. How it goes? Well, for instance, <coughs> you can go from the you doing as in any conformal field theory, you can go you can map the plane the plane to the cylinder through this 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 change of coordinate, the logarithm of R equal to t and a conformal transformation as well. And if you do that, and you use this, you, you put the cusp in the center of, 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 of the plane of your map, uh, these lines that suddenly change its direction are mapped to two parallel lines in the cylinder, which are not antipodal, but now separated by the instance pi minus phi. Right? Not only that, but also now if you wonder what it is the, the the, the temporal or the, the, the t length or the t extension of these lines is precisely well the logarithm of a, an infrared cutoff minus the logarithm of a UV cutoff. The logarithm because of this is precisely the way in which you relate t and, and, and radial distances in the plane. So this is so t is log of <laughs> ir over log of the of the infrared cutoff over the UV cutoff, which is precisely what you get here. So then you replace this by t, but then you interpret this as the quark and antiquark potential. Now, when you define your theory in the, in the in the cylinder, but if you're interested in the quark antiquark potential in the plane, you only need to take phi going to pi, and then the, your 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 pair of particles won't see the, the curvature of the sphere. So, and also the the restraining function. Now, if you take the opposite regime in which phi is is very small, so this is like an a small deviation from the from the straight line and this is a wavy line. So just this, this cusp anomaly that I mentioned when you expand it in powers of this phi, the, the quadratic order, the first order quadratic in phi is gonna be the precisely the restoring function. Right? So this two this cusp anomaly dimension uh, encodes this these these two important physical uh, properties of a gauge theory. So, well, but how it is that you, you can describe, well, it, it turned out that y in n equal four super young mills, you can compute this cusp anomaly dimension using integrability. How it goes? Well, the, the story went as follows. Uh, well, let me first explain wh what type of Wilson loop I'm going back to uh, uh, your, your question. Um, Francesco's question about what was 5-4. So we are going to be considering uh, a Wilson loop, which is not an external particle, well, that couples to the, to, the, to the gauge fields, but also couples to the scalar fields. In n equal 4, in addition to the gauge potential, you have many other fields in the actual representation. In particular, you have six real scalars. So you can think that the external particle also couples to them, and this is uh, this additional term in the, in the contour integral, right? So this is like a, a vector in R6. So, and you see that if you take it to be a unit vector, this guy is locally supersymmetric, right? In, in, the, in the other case, I was taking like eta, n, when just taking the direction phi four, like one of the, cut into only one of the scalar fields. That was the, the phi four in the, in the, is that clear? So, but then, when, when, I, when I said that we, we, were, we were interested in the generalized Wilson loop, we will relax this condition, so we, we are going to add a coefficient, so that now the coupling is going, through, is going to be through a, a vector which is no longer unitary. Uh, it's not unit length. 
So, okay. So, how 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 could you how is that integrability shows up in this in this context? Well, we will consider insertions of composite operators in this Wilson line, right? So you have this Wilson loop, and we will insert some operator, which is a local operator, local in the in, in a point of the line, and it's a compos it's composite of it's a product of many fields. You have in equal four superior mills. For instance, in this case, I was just taking two carrel fields. Um, and this is the usual um, connection you make with the spin chains when you identify, for instance, if you restrict yourself to, this is what it is called the SU2 sector, when you consider these composite operators to be made built out of two kind of fields, set and, and X, you can identify each of them as one of the two possible orientations of a spin of SU2, and then you can map all possible composite operators to all possible spin chains states of, of a Heisenberg spin chain, right? So in this case, the Wilson loop is acting as open boundary conditions for this, this, this local operator O. So this is the way in which you, you get a map between uh, insertions and spin chain states. But then what, what you can do is just to, to, con to insert more than more in more insert more operators along the line, and for instance, you consider the insertion of two operators. There is a, a as once you compute this at the quantum level, there is a mix, a non-trivial mixing between the operators uh, inserted in one point and the other. Uh, you have to diagonalize it, and and this mixing is going to be driven by through I don't know different vertices and, and Feynman diagrams you, you can draw. So here I'm representing the, the red lines are the, the, contu the contour of the Wilson loop. So all, I mean, all this is just a point in the, in the Wilson loop. This is another point. And this is just, it's open to emphasize that it's a composite operator. So all, all these are evaluated at tau. But then you can, you, you have to do all possible Feynman diagrams that contract uh, uh, all the fields you have in, in, the, in, this, in this quantity, in, the, in, this, in this bracket. So, as I said, while well this problem was originally proposed in this old paper by Drucker and Kawamoto, and what they consider was, what I, I said, it is named as the SU2 sector, is when you consider you restrict your, your possible insertions to be made out of only two chiral fields. You have, uh, you, you can define three. And notice that we were using that, we're taking the, the, this m vector that specifies the coupling with the scalar to be only non coupling only to the five fourth one of the fields, and notice that the SU2 sector is using chiral fields that do not include five four, right? So there is no. It could be this is to prevent the coupling between. Uh, sorry. Five yeah. fourths and, and these chiral fields in the in the inserted in the chain. So, well, they did that, and they when they computed this. Uh, the mixing operator that makes this all possible insertions you, you, could, you could make in this sector. And what they found, it was the typical Heisenberg spin chain with open boundary conditions now. Yes, this is just one minus the permutation. And I this is a problem that was known to be integral from, from, from many years. So you now, um, well, that, 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 that this integral today I'm going to be meaning that you can solve it using the better answers. So well, how it is this connected at all with the, with the Casper number of dimension I was introducing? Well, in the following way. So, I mean, this is just one sketchy slide. I'm not going to give details of this, but it's just to motivate why it is important to discover integrability in the presence of in, in these insertions, the mixing of insertions in some loops. You see, uh, after there was like a silence between this problem, between this, this paper by, by Drucker and Kawamoto, and, 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 and well, finally it was possible to, to use it to compute the Casper Nolan dimension. And the idea is as follows. Well, y you need to, 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 to have control of, of insertions, not only in this SU2 sector, you have to need to consider larger sectors and beyond one loop, right? 
And that was possible because you can use this residual symmetry SU2 plus 2, which is the symmetry of the vacuum. So when you do a better answer, you, you pick a vacuum, a reference state, which, which has symmetries. And also you have symmetries. Uh, uh, the, the your Wilson loop has symmetries. So this SU2 plus 2 is like the, the common symmetry between the two. So you, you, you would expect the scattering of excitations on this vacuum to preserve this symmetry. And this restricts heavily what is uh, what kind of, of boundary reflection matrix you can have. You can you can use this to, to fix all loop to all loop order the, the reflection matrix of excitations in your in your beta ansatz. And then you, you fix it and then you realize you, you can show that it satisfies uh, this uh, Jan Baxter, boundary Jan Baxter equation, which is a condition for integrability, a consistency condition for integrability. So, well, then you can you can do a better answer to compute the spectrum of excitations of insertions of the dimensions of insertions in this in this Wilson loop. You just you ins how, how do you get a cusp? Well, you can make a, a global rotation of one of the reflection matrices, and then what you are going to have in this case is like uh, an insertion. I mean, the, the, ins the, the insertion at the tip of the cusp. Uh, well, for those who, who work in integrability, they know that the better answer is only asymptotic. If you would like to now consider insertions of, of operators of finite length, you need to incorporate finite length, length correction, and this is done through a thermodynamic better answer. Uh, and in particular, you can use this thermodynamic variance to, to, to get a finite size corrected uh, energies of all the states you could insert. And in particular, you can focus on the vacuum. So the vacuum, if there were no cusp, it, it is supersymmetric and it develops no anomalous dimension. But as soon as there is a cusp, this is no longer supersymmetric. And the, the, there is an, a, like a Casimir energy uh, because of this finite lens. Uh, and then you can compute it using this thermodynamic beta ansat. And then if you eventually take the limit of L going to zero, or the energy of this vacuum, so the scale dimension of, the, of an insertion of L uh, uh, factors of this, this uh, kind of field set, when you take L going to zero, finally you end up with no insertion at all, and then you use just a cusp line, and then this is precisely, this limit precisely gives you the the cusp anomaly dimension. Okay, maybe if, if, if you l let me just say that once you discover integrability, you you, you might be able to to, de to develop a prescriptions to compute the, the cusp anomaly dimension, and that was done for the case of, of super sim locally supersymmetry Wilson loops. So, okay, let me now turn to so so, so far it was like a the motivation of, of what I'm going to present now. So if there are questions, please. It's a good moment. Okay. Let, let me so move on and then let's try to to, to to present the details of, 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 of the recent results. So we, we just discovered that there is integrability in some non-supersymmetric Wilson loops. So what we did in, 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 in a sentence is that we took the, this old paper by Drucker and Kawamoto and we generalized it in, in two ways. So Drucker and Kawamoto, what they did was they proved the, the integrability, the one-to-one -one loop order, one loop in perturbation theory, and when they restricted the insertions to be in the SU in the in the, S in the SU2 sector. So we generalize their analysis in, in, in two ways. First, we consider a larger sector. We move from SU2 to SO6. So meaning that instead of considering only two chiral fields, we consider all possible scalar fields you have in an equal force by angle, the three chiral and three antichiral. So um, which turns out to be a closed sector to one loop order. And then another generalization is that instead of considering the insertions in the locally supersymmetric Wilson loop, we consider the insertions in this generalized Wilson loop, which is generalized 
through the addition of this uh, parameter zeta that interpolates between the ordinary Wilson loop when you set zeta equal to zero and the locally supersymmetric Wilson loop when you set zeta equal to one. By itself, this is a very interesting object. You realize the generalized Wilson loop because it can be interpreted uh, as a one-dimensional defect field theory defined on, on, the, uh, on the line if your Wilson loop is a line or on the circle if your Wilson loop is a circle. And this, this additional coupling is interpreted as a coupling constant in this one-dimensional field theory. And then you, you can show, and this was done by Polchinski as, and, Sul and Sully also some years ago, that there is a running of this coupling uh, with a scale. So, and they, they computed the beta function to one loop order, and they found this. And from this, you read that uh, not, not only this, this, this zeta coefficient runs with a, with a scale, but also that the, the locally supersymmetric Wilson loop when z is equal to one, is an infrared fixed point of this running, a supersymmetric infrared fixed point, while the zeta equal to zero, is a, is, which is the, the ordinary Wilson loop when you don't have any coupling with the scalar fields here, is a, is a UV fixed point of this, of this running, right? So it's, so it's, 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 it's a running from the you known supersymmetric UV fixed point to a supersymmetric infrared fixed point. Yes, yes. I, I will be... Most interoperability results are, are, are in the planar limit, so yes, thank you for the question. So I'll be, I'll be working in, in, the, in the, the perturbative uh, leading order in the, in the lambda expansion, but one loop order, but in the planar limit. Uh, okay, so that was a few words about this generalized object, so le let me just turn to the, the computations. Well, what, uh, as I said, we are going to insert scalar operators uh, built out of all six real scalars you have in equal four to the mills, inserted in this generalized Wilson line. Let me emphasize that I will be drawing circles, yes, but my, my computations are, are only in the line. So this is, you see, already from the parametrization, that I'm taking only a, a line along the uh, X0 direction. This is also Euclidean, but let me, it's an Euclidean time direction, if you, if you prefer. But this is a line. It's a, it's a Wilson line, and a straight Wilson line. I Just for simplicity and to get a nicer picture, I'm going to draw this as a, as a circle, but it, it is a line. Okay, so as I said, well, well, when, you when you start to compute this, when you introduce uh, loop orders, loop corrections to this uh, expectation value, you're going to get some mixing. So let's start with the uh, at three level, or the lowest order. Uh, the only thing you could have is, is, is to, to have the all the insertions contracted with free propagators, and they have to be identical, or more precisely, you have to be some uh, uh, insertion here, and here it has to be the complex conjugated. The only thing you can do is just to contract with the free propagators, and out of this, you read that the scale dimension of, of these insertions is just L, the number of, of insertions. You have each scalar field has dimension one, so if, 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 if your insertion has L, scalar fields, the dimension to three level, uh, to see the loop order is, is, is L. Now, what we wanted to, to do is to, to do a one loop computation. And here you can distinguish between different types of, of contributions. Uh, so this should be a, a D1, so this is a one loop. This is going to be like a, a constant term, some bulk Hamiltonian, because this, this dilatation or this mixing operator is going to be interpreted as the Hamiltonian of an open spin chain. That's and this is bulk, it's like the bulk of the spin chain, and this is H boundary. It has to do, it's going to be interpreted as a boundary term for this spin chain Hamiltonian. So, but as I said, there is, before going to the 
To that, there is, you, you can also identify a constant term. The constant term comes from when, whenever you contract all the fields in your insertions with free propagators as in the tree level order. But in addition to that, you, you have like a propagator between two fields uh, along the, the, the Wilson line. And so I, I emphasize again, so the red line is, 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 is a Wilson loop and this uh, black lines are scalar propagators and this wavy line is a, is a gluon propagator. So since now you, when you, you, you expand the exponential of your Wilson loop, you, you can get a propagator between one of the five-fourth fields you have in the Wilson loop or in the propagator between the A zeros, the gluons you have in the, in the in also in, in the Wilson loop. Typically, when you do this in the, in the Wilson line, in the for the supersymmetric Wilson loop in the, in the straight line, the, the scalar, the propagator of the scalar fields cancels precisely with the propagator of, of, of a gauge fields. And, that's and because of that, it is when you take a straight Wilson line, locally supersymmetric, uh, there is no quantum correction and its expectation value is exactly one. <laughs> right? But now, we are, we are not considering this guy. When, when you do this, this, this the, the propagator, now you, you have like an extra set coefficient in front of the scalar fields. So when you compute this a scalar propagator, you get like a set square factor. So this contributes with a constant term, which is non-vanishing, unless you are in the locally supersymmetric case. But if you are not, you get this, this contributes to the anomalous dimension uh, of, of this insertion with a constant term, which is proportional to uh, set square minus one. I'm not going giving any detail, but what you have to do is to identify the logarithmic diversions in on those on those diagrams, and from that you can extract how the what anomalous dimension do you do you get from this? But okay, so that's one possible. Then you have these bulk terms, which you, you get them whenever you contract all possible propagators and vertices only among the fields of your insertions, right? I'm drawing just one of them, like it's like a four-point vertex between four scalar fields, but you can. You can have similar diagrams when two neighboring fields, two or the propagator between two neighboring fields in the insertions exchange a gluon, or you have even one loop corrections to the propagators of those, those scalar fields. When you add up all the thing, all these things, you get nothing but the SO6 spin chain that was already this, uh, computed many, many years ago in the seminal paper by, by Joe and, and Kostya when they discovered the, this, this, uh, the single traces in this SO6 sector was an integral problem with this uh, spin chain Hamiltonian. But now this is, uh, well, it is, the, it is an open spin chain. So wha what it is, you have one minus the permutation and this trace, um, this trace operator. Okay. No, that's, that's, uh, this is not surprising. So the new thing, what it is characterizing, the, the, the kind of, of open problem we, we, we are dealing with, so it is the, the boundary terms, right? So and the boundary terms are due to the interaction between the insertions and fields in the, in the Wilson loop. So let me just um, discuss a few contributions. So... First at all, well, we have this. This was already computed in the, in the, the old paper by Drucker and Kawamoto when you have, um, well, it, it is possible to have like a, a vertex between two scalars and a, and a, and a gauge field contracted with, a ga with one of the gauge fields in the, in the Wilson loop. But it turns out that this exactly cancels. You, you may say that this guy is, is not a boundary term because I said that you get boundary terms when you contract the insertions with fields in the Wilson loop, and this is certainly not contracting with anything in the Wilson loop, but this is like a, a remnant of the, of the bulk spin chain. Here, I mean, as I said, you have also, have like all diagrams contributing to this bulk spin chain is due to the interaction between two neighboring sites. So suppose that you have a periodic um, length, chain of length L, so you have 
all possible interaction between neighbor insights. But also there, is, there are contributions from uh, one loop corrections. And since you have L length, L, 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 L fields, you also have L. So you have like uh, in the periodic chain, you have L diagrams of this sort, and you have L one loop corrections, right? Um, but now, now that the spin chain is open, uh, since uh, now you, you can only have L minus one, so if you have L sites, you have only L minus one uh, diagrams of these four, so you have L minus one diagrams of the interaction of this sort, but you still have L terms, L, L one loop correction. So there is like an excess of one loop uh, correction to the determinants. So one half of it is associated with a left uh, boundary, and the other half is 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 associated. So so this excess of this uh, extra uh, one loop correction is 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 collected with the boundary terms. And it turns out that these two diagrams, that the logarithmic divergence of these two, exactly cancel. So it was already pointed out in this paper by Drucker and Kawamoto, where they were studying the SU2 sector. What, what it is new to us, uh, because uh, we are in the SO6 sector, is that now, as I said, when, when, when Drucker and Kawamoto never uh, had this kind of, of vertices because they were in the SG2 sector such that the, the chiral fields were not including the, the, the 5 4, which is the, 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 the field, the scalar field we have in the Wilson loop. But since we are in the SO6 sector, we could have a 5 4 at the rightmost or the leftmost point of the insertion. So you can also have this kind of, of terms when you, the, the rightmost field, if it is a 5 4, can be contracted with the 5 4 of the Wilson loop. Um, and also with the other insertion. So, okay, so you, you have to, to, to compute these this guys, you identify the, the, log the logarithmic divergence, and then you see that it contributes with the boundary term, it's boundary because it's only non-vanishing with the, in the first side there is a 5 fourth, or in the, the last side is a 5 fourth. It's one or zero otherwise, sorry. Okay, so, This is uh, the dilatation operator we, we obtain. So we, we got this, this, this constant term, the usual um, SO6 bulk spin chain, Hamiltonian, and these boundary terms that are non-vanishing only when you, you have this, this flavor 5-4 in, in, the, in the outmost uh, fields of the chain. Now, if, if you wonder about the integrability of a spin chain, what you can try to do is try to see if it is possible to solve it using a, a, a very ansatz, right? Um, sorry? Yes. Exactly. So the, the, these extra terms are going to specify what type of reflection matrix we, we, we have, and then depending on what particular type of reflection matrix you have, you, you can conclude that your problem is integral or not. Exactly. So, but as I said, uh, to, 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 to conclude about the integrability, what we are going to do is try to solve this problem using doing a very answer. A very answer, the, the, the very first step you have to do is just to specify what is going to be the vacuum or your reference state on, on top of which you are going to propagate uh, magnon impurities. So, in this case, we, we take um, uh, just a chiral field to the power of, I mean, a chiral field occupying all sides of the chain, and this is has vanishing bulk energy since there is no 5 4, also these boundary terms are vanishing. So only ha the only energy you th they have is this, this constant term, A0. On top of it, so for, for the moment, uh, Let's forget about the boundaries. Imagine that you have an infinite chain. Uh, you, you can you can 
you can propagate impurities. I'm going to call phi A impurities from 1 to 4. Uh, and then you can put an impurity in the L, well, in, in, a, in a generic position with some momentum P. And this is what is typically called a magnum, right? Now, now if you plug this in the bulk, uh, Hamiltonian, and you think of this as an infinite length, you, you, you see that this is a, it's an eigenstate of the spin chain Hamiltonian with energy, this reference state energy plus some energy which is attributed to the energy of the magnum. Right? So, good. But now you would like to consider, well, this is just one possible uh, state, so a, a bunch of self field with an impurity which is some phi. 1 to 4, but then you can have more impurity. And then you, you, you can write down like a, like a wave function for two impurities. It's, it's like a, well, the superposition of two magnums. This is an eigenstate when they are f uh, very far from each other, but at some point when they are next to each other, they can scatter and, and, and go through with, the, with some scattering factor. And this is uh, indicated in this in the second term, that is, uh, so this is like the incoming uh, magnons, those are the scattered magnons. But in this SO6 sector, you also have the, this, what I call the decay to Z bar, because of this, uh, this trace. This trace Hamiltonian, this trace, whenever you have two impurities of the same flavor, you get out of, you, you can get out of this. Uh, let's say you have phi, phi 1, phi 1. This, this is going to give you phi 1, phi 1, phi 2, phi 2, phi 3, all possible pairs of, including phi 5, phi 5, and phi 6, phi 6. But this can be rewritten in terms of this kind as, as a set and set bar, right? So you, you have like a, a, one, a phi 1 impurity and a phi 1 impurity uh, coming as, as coming and at the, at the out state, what you get is, is a set and a set bar. So you get like a single impurity of the set bar type. So, and this is what I call the, de the decay, right? So you, you get like this, this extra term, which is like, a, uh, after the scattering, you, you, what you get is like a single set bar impurity with the momentum with this, the sum of its momentum. Well, it turns out that now, well, this is just an answer. Then you, 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 you plug this in this Hamiltonian, still thinking that this is infinite length. And this is an eigenstate of the, um, of the bulk spin chain, if you fix this uh, scattering matrices to, to be of this form. So they have to be very, they, they have to be of this very specific form, but if they are of this form, then you, you have like eigenstates of two magnum excitations on this, on this spin chain. Okay, then you might think, okay, but this is really getting difficult, then you had three magnums, you, you're gonna make an answer when you have uh, the scattering of three particles into three particles. And, and here is where integrability kicks in and simplifies things. Integrability ensures that more magnon excitations can only be written in terms of two magnon scattering factors. And that's it. Once you, you know the two, the two, the two magnon scattering matrices, you, you, you get everything you need to write all possible magnon excitations and, 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 and diagonalize this full spin chain. Okay, this is nothing new. That was already known since the, 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 the work by, by Nina and Sarembo. So, as I said, the new thing is that now we are, we have this bulk spin chain with some boundary terms, and, they, and what we have is, is open boundary conditions. So, in the presence of the boundary, uh, well, against one magnon eigenstates cannot be just one magnon with momentum p. It's going to be the superposition of a left-moving magnon with momentum p and a right-moving magnum with momentum minus p, with some reflection matrix factor, as, as uh, he was pointing out. And then yeah, well, you make this answer, you, you plug this in your one loop, in your spin chain Hamiltonian, demand that this answer is an eigenstate, and this reflection matrix cannot be anything, it has to be of a very par particular type. So you, of course, you, since now, the only flavor is treated differently is phi 4 and then phi 1, phi 2 and phi 3 uh, are, are more or less the same, you, you expect that you get like this uh, well, diagonal reflection but with different factors if your impurity is 1, 2, or 3, 
or if it is a uh, four, it's five four. So and and this is what you get. Um, this is the the, the scattering, the, the reflection factor for the five four impurity, and this is the reflection factor for five one, five two, and five three impurity. Okay. Um, as, as I was saying, in integrability ensures that uh, when, when you uh, want to, to write down the, that instead of trying to compute or to make an answer for the three to three uh, scattering matrix, the integrability ensures that this can always be decomposed in a succession of two to magnum scattering matrices, but since, it, since they are matrices, this can be done in this way, or it can be done in, in this other way, and these are two different factorizations that unless your, your, your ma US matrix is, is of a very specific form, I, I, this is not going to be satisfied. So demanding that these two things are, are, are equal, these two possible factorizations are the same, is a consistency check for integrability. So if, okay, since the, 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 the bulk spin, SOC spin chain was integral, of course it satisfies that. I'm not going to discuss this. But now when, we, when you're in the presence of a boundary, you, you have the same problem. So we, we just specify well, what is the reflection matrix of a single particle. But now <laughs> you would like, okay, what is the reflection of the two? Well, then you, you can factorize this in two ways. So these are the, the two pictures there. So now you, you can factorize this, the scattering, this, the reflection of the two magnon states into two magnon states in these two different ways. And these are different successions of reflections of individual magnons and bulk scatterings of the, these, these two particles. And a consistency check for integrability to persist in this when once you impose these open boundary conditions is that this boundary and Baxter equation is satisfied. So, and, and as I said, uh, from the one magnon state on the two magnon states in the infinite line, so the, the, the functions for the reflection matrix and the scattering matrix are, are fully fixed. So this is something you just, we have to take our uh, scattering and reflection matrix and check if, if this equation is satisfied. Well, of course this is a matricial equation because you can, have different flavors in the incoming particles and the outgoing particles. So there are many components. Many of them are trivially satisfied. But there, there are a few which are not trivially satisfied. And then you have this equation. And of course, you, you want this to be valid for any value of the, of, the, of the momenta of the incoming particles. So certainly it has to be zero for all values of Z1 and Z2, which is nothing but P1 and P2. So the, the only possibility for this being zero for all possible for all incoming momenta is that this numeric coefficient is vanishing. And okay, and this numeric coefficient can only vanish if this uh, set parameter, that, that that's the, the one way we, we add it to the generalized Wilson loop, is one or minus one. That's not surprising. We already knew that the, the maximally supersymmetric, Wilson, the locally supersymmetric Wilson loop was was integrable. But the thing is that not only this case integrable. Uh, okay, you might say that this is bad news. I mean, you, you, you are in the generalized Wilson loop, and for generic values of set, Darian Baxter uh, is not satisfied. That's true. But the good thing, the nice thing, is that <laughs> there is another case, which is precisely the other endpoint of this uh, renormalization group flow, um, which is set equal that corresponds to the ordinary Wilson loop, which is a non-supersymmetric Wilson loop. I mean, for, for me, it was, I mean, of course, there is not, not, uh, it's not uh, necessary to have supersymmetry to, be, to have integrability, but it is, nice, it is a nice example that this is an ordinary non-supersymmetric Wilson loop, which um, in this SO6 sector and to this one loop order uh, is integrable. Okay, but in the last 10 minutes or so, let me, okay, may you, you might say that, okay, this is very specific of one loop or the sector we are considering. So it would be nice to, to go beyond um, the sector and beyond one loop. That's, of course, as you can imagine, it's very difficult. 
if you would like to go beyond one loop, the SO sec sector is no longer closed, so they start to mix with other fields. So this is uh, not a possibility. You, you need to start to think of a different sector. Uh, another, th another thing that it would be nice to test, since this generalized Wilson loop is non supersymmetric, it would be nice to see if we can get a, a, a check of integrability in a sector that have also fermions and as, as well as bosons. Because you may think, okay, maybe uh, now is if not supersymmetry relating the reflection of the, the fermions and the bosons, uh, maybe when you, w you, you would not see the, the failure of integrability in the bosonic sector, but it may, may, may pop up when, when you consider this, this sectors that includes bosons and fermions. So, and we the sector we, we studied is this called SU2 slash three sector, which is, so the, the, the fields you are going to insert in the Wilson loop are either three chiral scalar fields, but not a complex conjugate, and the two components of an SU2 spin, right? Um, in general, they would be not closed because of the, the, the coupling with phi four. So if you get the reflection of Y can be reflected into a Y bar, but this is for set different from zero. Since we already rule out the integrability of set different from zero or one, we are only interested in the in the new case, which is set equal to zero. Set when set i is equal to zero, this SU2 slash three sector is closed. So uh, that's okay. Uh, another nice thing is about this SU2 sector is that it can it allows you to go like a little bit beyond one loop in a way I, I'm going to explain. This is the appearance of these intermediate loop orders. So for set equal to zero, what you get is, again, a one loop, or a one loop and, a, and a bit, a dilatation operator that is going to get a, a constant term, a bulk term, and a boundary term. Now the constant term is the same as before, but just set in set equal to zero, so then you get minus one. Since now you are in the in the in an SU sector, you don't have the trace, so it's one minus the permutation. Here is the, the graded permutation; it's just a permutation with a sign when the two fields are fermionic. Uh, but also there is so this is like a, a one loop Hamiltonian. But then you have like this loop loop and a half term to the Hamiltonian, which is a, a bit curious. It was uh, discovered by Pfizer in 2003. And, and it's very special, you see, it turns, uh, it's non-vanishing when you have two, two, a singlet of two fermions, and it gives you a singlet of three bosons. So it takes three, fermi three, three bosons into two fermions, and two fermions into three bosons. So it's a, it's, a, it's a term that changes the length of the spin chain. So it is called a dynamical spin chain. So, well, this is what I just said. This 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 is also a boundary term, uh, and and makes the length of the of the chain dynamical. Um, but but as you see, it's like an intermediate loop order. It's, it's, this is weird. Or this was weird to me when I first saw it. So then then you see that your wave function that to one loop order was order one has to be corrected with a term which is order square root of lambda. Yeah. Nevertheless, that instead in spite you you get this half integer powers of lambda in your wave functions, the, the energies of the eigenvalues of this uh, spin chain are still given in terms of integer powers of lambda, and it's a normal perturbative expansion. No problem with that. Um, okay. Uh, but now, okay, and then I didn't say anything about the boundary. So the boundary terms, I already claiming that this can only be fermionic. That's, that's okay, because for bosons, it is the same boundary terms. When if, if at the boundary we, we had bosons, it's the same boundary term we had before, but it was only non-vanishing when phi 4 was 0 with a set coefficient. But if we are now setting set equal to 0, there is no coupling with, there are, there are no phi 4 here, and that, so there is no uh, bosonic boundary term. So the only possibility is the a boundary term when, when you have a fermion field in the leftmost side of the insertion or in the rightmost. Again, you have that, like this uh, remanent term, one loop correction to a to the fermionic propagator now, one half of it has to be combined with the possibility of this fermion 
exchange in a, an, a, a gluon with the, with the A0 you have in the propagator. So you compute this, the sum of these two guys. In the case of scalars, this was zero, now it's not zero. And when you read, you extract the logarithmic divergence of these two diagrams, it con you, you, you fix this coefficient, alpha, to be one half. So alpha is not as before zeta, that was a parameter we, we introduced in the, in the Wilson loop by hand, and so we, we can move it to take any value we wanted. Here alpha is just fixed for the, 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 the diagram, Feynman diagrams, and it's equal to one, to one half, sorry. Okay, let me just speed up, because I ran out of time. Anyway, it's, it's more or less the same idea. Now we would like to ask whether this spin chain Hamiltonian, when alpha is equal to one half, is integrable or not. So we, we do the same. We, we do a better answer, so we pick a vacuum, again, a one of the chiral fields occupying all the sides of the spin chain. And then you can have four, sort, four types of flavor for the impurities. Either it could be you have two bosonic impurities with the other two chiral fields, X or Y, or two fermionic impurities, which are any of the, the two components of the f your fermion. So, and again, in the presence of, of boundary, well we what we need to do is to determine what it is the reflection matrix of this particular case, uh, and while well we make the answer of, of the superposition of a right moving and a, a reflected left moving uh, one mag a magnon, and then for this, when we plug this into the into the, the Hamiltonian for this to be an eigenstate, we need to fix the bosonic reflection mate, reflection factor to be this just the exponential of i the momentum, and the fermionic. Is, it is more complicated. Recall, I'm writing alpha in spite of alpha is not a free parameter, but just to, to, to see that the specific value of alpha is crucial. But recall, alpha for us is just one half. Okay, y we need to, to check this um, boundary and Baxter equation. We also need the, the bulk scattering um, matrix it's a little bit more subtle now because somehow we are beyond one loop. When, when you go beyond one loop, the, 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 the better answer is, is needs to be corrected with some contact terms. So the, I, this is what I included here. And now, since we, are, we have this, this term, this bulk term, to this intermediate loop order, lambda to the 3 half, we need also to expand uh, the wave function and, uh, and the, the S matrix appear in the wave function in, in orders of this square mg is just the square root of lambda, essentially. So I'm demanding that, that this wave function is an eigenstate of the this loop and a half Hamiltonian. It fixes fully what are the, the order zero or the order one of these scattering factors and also establishes a relation between the, the, contact, the contact factors. Anyway, we know, I mean, what, what it is the, the scattering uh, matrix. We know what is the reflection matrix. So we, we just check the boundary and Baxter equation. And when we look at the, now we have this, we are like an expansion in, in the powers of square root of lambda. We have order zero, order one. To order zero, you, we see that boundary and Baxter, all the components are satisfied without necessity of specifying the value of alpha. That's not not nice because it doesn't restrict him, doesn't know about the specific uh, boundary condition we have, but when, when, when you go to the next loop order or next uh, power of next order in G, there is a component that implies this quantity that is only vanishing if this numerical coefficient is zero. So this could be only vanishing if alpha were one or alpha were one half. Yes? We, d we do not free the we do not have the, the, the freedom to fix up, but but we computed alpha and we found that alpha was one half. So in this sector, and to this 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 others SU two slash three sector and to this loop and a half order, in uh, boundary and Baxter equation is also that satisfied. So let me just go to the conclusions. So what I, I did was consider the mixing operator for two insertions composite operators in a generalized Wilson loop. By generalized Wilson loop, I mean this adding this extra 
parameter set that interpolates between the locally supersymmetric Wilson loop when set is equal to one and the ordinary Wilson loop when set is equal to zero. And for the mixing of, of, of this problem, the mixing operator to one loop order, when you consider insertions in the SO6 sector, we found that, well, not only when set i equal one, well the, in the locally supersymmetric Wilson loop, this mixing operator is integral, but also when set i is equal to zero, which, which is the case in which you are inserting uh, these scalar fields, these this, this, this operators in, a, in an ordinary Wilson loop. Then we, for this very specific case of set equal to zero, we consider, we, we check that, to check that the, in, the integrability persists beyond one loop and beyond this sector, we consider this S2 slash sector and we check integrability, we check that the boundary and Baxter equation, this consistency condition for integrability persists even up to this one loop and a half order, right? Whatever it means. Uh, Anyway, well, it would be nice uh, just to go those so this is just this is not conclusive evidence, but it's compelling evidence. It would be nice uh, if one could uh, give more uh, convincing argument that the ordinary Wilson loops, the non supersymmetric Wilson loop is integrable. So in order to do that you, you can certainly go beyond one loop, consider larger sectors. So and once you, you are convinced that this if if you are convinced that this ordinary Wilson loop sets integral boundary conditions for the insertion, we might try to bootstrap that somehow try to compute the all loop expression for the reflection matrix of impurities, so for manual impurities of any sort. Just try to see if you can get a proposal for the all loop expression. And then formulating a TBA would allow you to compute the Casper loop that I mentioned in, in this other case. So thank you very much. So if you take zeta, which is not uh, zero and one, uh, the 